Hello there, the new. <laughs> this is Richard Briers. Well, we made it. To 1980, I mean. You know, when I was a youngster, I thought the 1980s sounded too much like science fiction ever to actually happen. The way the world was going, I reckon that by now we'd all either be robots or redundant. Of course, by the look of it, actors will be the only profession not phased out by science in the 1980s. Well, whoever heard of Hamlet played by a microchip? Though, did you see that, that American radio stations are now run on automatic pilot? There's nobody there at all, just computers and tapes. But don't worry, I assure you I'm here. But don't worry, I assure you I'm here. But don't worry, oh, I had enough of that. But I'll tell you one sign of things to come, as H.G. Wells put it. A friend of mine rang a firm in the States, and a voice answered, The answer phone service has broken down. This is a live human being speaking. Please do not ring off. Anyway, please don't turn off for the next hour and a quarter, because I'll be playing a selection from the very best of light entertainment last year. And to get you in the right mood for the 1980s, let's begin with an everyday story of simple galactic folk. Out of my way, little robot. I'm afraid I've been left here to stop you. You? Stop me? Go on. No, really, I have. What are you armed with? Guess. Guess? Yes, go on, you'll never guess. Um... Laser beam? No. No, 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 no. Too obvious, I suppose. Um... Um... How about an electron ram? What's that? One of these. No, not one of those. Good though, isn't it? Very good. I, I know, I know. It must be one of those with, with twirls, you know, whoosh. Um... No, you're thinking along the wrong lines, you know. You're failing to take into account something fairly basic in the relationship between men and robots. Oh, 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 I, I know, I know. I've, I've seen them. Uh, they're oh, quite big. Um, no, look. Uh, no, just think. They left me an ordinary menial robot to stop you, a gigantic heavy-duty battle machine, whilst they ran off to save themselves. What do you think they would leave me with? Well, something pretty damn devastating, I would expect. Expect? Oh, yes, expect. I'll tell you what they gave me to protect myself with, shall I? Yes, all right. Nothing. What? Nothing at all. Not an electronic sausage. Whoa. Doesn't that just take the biscuit? And me with this terrible pain in all the diodes down my left side. Yeah? Oh, that makes me angry. Think I'll smash that wall down. That's very impressive. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. I can take this floor out too. No trouble. <laughs> Machine. That was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a story which starts with the world being destroyed to make way for a bypass. Fiction, of course. We all know the world would eventually be destroyed to make way for a nuclear power station. Our reactor's blowing bubbles, deadly bubbles getting stuck. There was some doubt that they might burst out, spraying hot strontium about. Nothing happened this time, but queer horror struck. Not so much because of bubbles, but the passing of the The Week Ending Team, showing how nuclear power will solve the heating oil crisis by converting the Earth into a large cinder. Incidentally, as part of the BBC programme plans for the 80s, Week Ending scriptwriters have been specially trained so that in the event of Armageddon, they can write an entire sketch with just a four-minute warning. Still, instead of worrying about the future, let us try living in the past. Back to the summer with Roy Hudd. Well, it is nice to see all these suntan faces, eh, after that gorgeous summer, wasn't it? Do uh, you remember it? That Thursday afternoon in July, you remember? <laughs> but whatever the weather, the news still happens. Yeah. <laughs> in the air, things weren't going quite as planned. The American Skylab was falling faster than Ladbrook shares, do you remember? 
There was no danger because Skylab's brain had been programmed to make it land in a desolate outback of Australia, and it did. It flattened a bed sitter in Earl's Court. <laughs> And, of course, we had the ever-present fuel crisis and people were coming up with all sorts of ideas to save petrol. Like that British Leyland worker who sold his car and bought a seaside donkey to take him to work, yeah. And it's just the job, you know. It goes 50 yards, then turn round and takes him home again. <laughs> Then came the Tokyo Summit, the Tokyo Summit. Mrs. Thatcher and her husband, Dennis, arrived in Japan and were introduced to President Jimmy Carter. Well, howdy there, partner. It's mighty fine to meet y'all. Dennis, how many times have I told you not to speak like that? <laughs> President, President Kara, I like you, mate, on the bar, Mrs. Ratcher. That's better, Dennis. <laughs> And, of course, the summer had its usual crop of silly stories, like that report from Germany that said couples could ring their doctor at his home if they weren't enjoying sex. Yeah? Herr yeah, Doctor, I'm afraid I'm not enjoying sex. What about me? I've got to stop and answer the phone every five minutes. <laughs> Do you remember that pork butcher? A pork butcher who got a job in a hospital as a consultant surgeon, eh? Apparently the authorities twigged, cos after each operation he hung the patient up on a hook. <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember... do you remember this sound? That'll teach people to play guitars in church, eh? <laughs> then there were strong objections when we read that the South African mixed rugby team were planning to do a tour of this country. Mm, they're just like any other team, only the blacks aren't allowed to score. <laughs> <laughs> then came the announcement that Farrah Fawcett Majors and the Bionic Man had separated. Ah. Oh. She went back to her mother and he went back to Meccano. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we hardly heard a word from ex-Prime Minister James Callaghan. No. That's because I was employed secretly in great matters of state. You were? Yes. For instance, I flew with Maggie when she went to the Commonwealth Conference in Lusaka. Steward? What do you want, you old battle axe? <laughs> Why are we flying over the North Pole? You'll find out when I get this door open. <laughs> <laughs> But he didn't, more's the pity, and the Iron Maiden landed in Lusaka. And in an interview, Maggie revealed that she gets nervous before she speaks. That's nothing. We all get nervous before she speaks. <laughs> At Blackpool was the venue for the TUC conference, and I'm afraid it looks as though we're in for another cold, dark winter. In fact, on the prom, they were selling sticks of rock with wicks in the end. <laughs> and the highlight of the conference, though, was Alan Fisher's blatant attack on the media, denying allegations that he was a Hitler, a Napoleon and a Mussolini all rolled into one. And he clicked his heels and took Josephine out for a pizza. <laughs> and I see that Wedgie Ben has been calling for a left-wing paper, saying it would give people a choice. It won't work. They'll still use Andrex, believe me. <laughs> Roy Hudd. Of course, it's amazing any news bothered to happen at all without the Times, because judging from all their adverts right now, you'd think all human life had stopped for 12 months. Anyway, if the news headlines version of the past isn't escapist enough for you, how about this? In the bar, in the bar, in the bar, in the bar. Oh, I find much simple pleasure when I've had a tiring day. In the bar, in the bath, in the bath. Where the noise of gentle sponging seems to blend with my tope. In the bar, in the bath, in the bath. To the skull of pipes vibrating in the boiler room below, I sing a potpourri of all the songs I used to know. And the water thunders in and gurgles down the overflow in the bath, in the bath. Then the loathing for my 
my fellows rises steaming from my brain in the bath, in the bath, in, in the, the bath, and condenseth to the milk of human kindness once again in the bath, in the bath, in the bath. Oh, the tingling of the scrubbing brush, the flannel soft caress. To wield a lordly loofah is a joy I can't express. How truly is it spoken, one is next to godliness. In the bath, in the bath, in the bath, in the bath, in the bath. Then there comes that dreadful moment. When the water's running cold In the bath, in the bath, in the bath, in the bath When the soap is lost forever And one's feeling tired and old In the bath, in the bath, in the bath It's time to pull the plug out Time to mop the bathroom floor Oh, the towel is in the cupboard and the cupboard is next door. Yikes! It started running hot. Let's have another hour or more. In the bath. In the bath. In the bath. I can see the one salvation of the poor old human race. In the bath. In the bath. In the bath. Let the nations of the world all meet together face to face In the bath, in the bath Putting Carter, Castro, Callahan and all those other chaps With Flanders, Swan and Coward Then we'll have some peace perhaps Provided the King Singers get the end without the taps In the bath, in the bath, in the bath, in the bath. The King Singers, all in one bath. Well, now, I make it about 11 hours gone so far. That means the first two major events of the year have already happened. Five million people will have given up smoking, and another five million will have found it too big an effort to keep a diary after all. You know, there must be a small fortune to be had by producing very small one-page diaries for all those with boring lives. There is one way to make sure you keep writing a diary, and that's by turning it into a radio series, like Alfred Marx. The year is 1934, two years after the dreadful 1932, six years after the awful 1928, and ooh, hundreds of years after the really rotten 1346. <laughs> young Alfred, young Alfred sits scribbling away in his scrapbook that he calls a diary because he can't remember what a scrapbook is called. Dear diary, yesterday in school the teacher asked me to write about what happened when I went on holiday. I told her we were too poor to go on holiday this year, so she told me to write about what happened when somebody else went on holiday. <laughs> so I wrote about how my dad breaks into their houses. <laughs> Joy, today is my birthday. I am four years old today. Actually, I'm 11, but father says we have to economise. <laughs> Imagine my surprise when I looked and saw something wrapped in brightly coloured paper at the bottom of my bed. With trembling fingers, I tore at the wrappings, and there was a goldfish. <laughs> Daddy said he'd get me the bowl and the water for Christmas. <laughs> In the afternoon, I had a party. Mother asked all the kids in the neighbourhood, but only three came. I told her that the entrance fee was too high. <laughs> but it was probably a good job, because the gobstopper wouldn't have gone round anymore. <laughs> in the evening, for a special treat, Daddy took me to the cinema. We spent about 15 minutes standing outside looking at it, and then we went home. <laughs> He took me by the hand. Son. He said. As it's your birthday today, instead of running home behind the bus to save tuppence, 
We'll run on behind a taxi and save three shillings. <laughs> in real life nowadays, though, publishers don't so much call them diaries as memoirs. The difference between a diary and a memoir is usually about £5.50. If you went round the bookshops at Christmas, it seemed that writing their own memoirs was just about the only growth industry that politicians had managed to produce. Politics used to be the art of the possible. Now it's the art of arranging current events into a personal bestseller. Cabinet ministers used to resign on principle. Soon they'll be resigning to meet publishing deadlines. Either that or they won't be able to fit their committee meetings in with their guest appearances on chat shows. Mind you, all sorts of odd people turn up as guests in shows these days. Hello, cheeky. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start tonight's show, we're delighted to announce that our special guest in the studio tonight is Terry Wogan. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, sitting in the third row, between the meth drinker and that lady with the handlebar moustache. <laughs> Hello, Terry. And so, on with the show. Excuse me. Uh, sit down, Terry. Uh, no, I thought I was the guest. You are, and very welcome. Now go and sit down. I haven't got a script. We don't give our audiences scripts. They know the jokes anyway. <laughs> go and sit down. But if I'm the, I'm the guest... You got an introduction, a round of applause and a free seat. What more do you want? <laughs> Everyone gets a free seat. Shh! We've been charging 50p a head. What? <laughs> if we don't, by the time we've paid our bus fare home, we're out of pocket. But I thought I was... Terry. My patience is wearing thin. So's your suit. <laughs> oh, you look at those sleeves. Grey, wrinkled, shapeless. Oh, sorry. Those are your arms. <laughs> Go and sit down. I can't. Your man has spilt mets all over the seat. I mean, look at him there. Slumped in that greasy raincoat. Unshaven. And the boots with last week's Sunday mirror sticking out. I'd complain to me agent, but for one thing. What's that? He is my agent. <laughs> he handles Eamon Andrews, you know. He's Eamon's agent? No, just keeps going up to him and handling him. <laughs> Terry, although I, quite sincerely, find this deeply and rivetingly dull, we have to get on with the show. You mean, I can't do anything? I've heard that. <laughs> Can I not contribute to your show at all? Yes. Shut up. Lads, <laughs> lads, lads, I, I think we're being... A bit hard on him. Thank you, madam. My pleasure, Mr. Aspel. <laughs> this could turn... This could turn very nasty. What? This three-week-old pork pie. <laughs> I got it in the canteen. Why didn't you eat it? I don't like this label on it. Packed under the personal supervision of Dr. Christian Barnard. <laughs> I once found a worrying label on a tin of corned beef at home, you know. It said, eat before the Munich crisis. <laughs> There is something you could do, Terry, that would help make the show go with a swing. Oh, yeah. What's that? Go and get the teas. I will, sir, he said, trying to ingratiate himself with the three ageing funsters. <laughs> God. God knows why. What's the order? Five teas, two with sugar, two without, one lemon, two cheese and chutney sandwiches, one brown, one white, two corned beef, one egg and cress, and a packet of those biscuits with the squash flies in them. Got it. You better ask the others what they want. Saints and embalming fluid preservers. What would you like, Mr. Cryer, sir? To think I've sunk to this. <laughs> meanwhile, here is a meanwhile. Meanwhile, in a police station, a constable enters with a member of the public. Hit me with your rhythm stick. Oh. Hit me! Hit oh. me! All right, Carruthers, oh. what's all this about? Hit me with that rhythm. All right, Hit all me. right, all right. Hit me. All right, let's have the old story. Well, I found the constable outside like this, and I thought we'd be safe in here. Three jugs of cocoa, two packets of biscuits, and some jelly babies, all boys. Right, good, good. One of you is give me a hand. What, to help carry the tea back? No, to help carry the list out. Oh. <laughs> Poor Terry Wogan. He always gets lumbered with things nobody else would ever want, like blankety blank. No, to be fair, I quite like blankety blank. But like most people who do, I prefer to remain a closet viewer in case I'm sneered at in the street. But still, I suppose moving on from come dancing was one giant stride for Terry Wogan and a quick two-step for mankind. Welcome back to the Hammersmith Palais for the Formation Dancing Championships. As onto the floor come the North East Midlands Roadworks Formation Dancers. <laughs> Sorry about all that. Those grumble weeds get everywhere. 
I was just about to play you an extract from one of radio's most popular programmes, The Burkis Way. And welcome back yet again to the Formation Dancing Finals at the Hammersmith Palais. And just taking the floor are the North East Midlands Dentist Formation Dance Team. <laughs> I'm very sorry about all this. The Grumbleweeds, again. And now, The Burkis Way. <laughs> present the blood gushing all over the screen in question, written and gesticulated by Dr. Jonathan Makeshift Impersonation, the only man whose hands are too loud for the death. Each week, Dr. Makeshift Impersonation carefully talks through a different area of the body. This week, his mouth. <laughs> Here I am in one of the most ancient, some might say revolting, <laughs> relics of the Middle Ages. Now musty, mildewed and decayed with the passage of time. In fact, it's hard to believe it was ever a jersey at all. <laughs> and yet, the real protector of my organs and tissues is not my jersey, but my body. That's to say, this thing with arms and legs just visible behind my nose. <laughs> Even today, even today, few people are really aware of the body and how it functions. Uh, you, you, sir, any idea where your, where your brain is? Mmm. <laughs> my, my brain. Your brain, yes. My brain. Your brain. Uh, brain. Oh, yes, it's up here. Oh, dear, no, no, I, I don't think it's up there, Constable. <laughs> Inspector! Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Probably is there. Oh, hello, madam. Do you think you could show me where the mammary gland is, please? Sure, that I could, yes. It's just down there, and it's the second on the left. Excellent. <laughs> In general, then, a certain lack of self-awareness. Why should this be? I think the best way for me to explain this, really, is to crouch about here on the seashore wearing <laughs> wearing a baggy pair of corduroy trousers whilst jerking my hands up and down like an octopus with St Vitus dance. In fact, of course, medicine today is relatively advanced. I have to say it's no longer a mystery how human bodies work, although in the case of stockbrokers it is still a mystery why. <laughs> and yet a few hundred years ago, medical treatment was a lot more primitive than it is today. That's to say, a few hundred years ago, medical treatment was a lot more primitive than it is today. <laughs> well, if medical treatment was crude then, illnesses were even more so. I have to say, it wasn't until great visionaries like Sir Joseph Typhus and Dr. William Bumbo came along that the development of serious disorders really began to make progress. <laughs> Typhus, in 1649, was very clearly quite close to victory. That I have now developed the nasty disease I have been searching for all these years... I am convinced. My one problem remains how best to spread it. My initial method of advertising it in a newsagent's window... <laughs> ..plague available, easy terms... ..seems to have met with little success. However, I am now certain that the plague may in fact be spread by rats. All it needs is one bite to transfer it to the human body. And so, for 14 years, Typhus waited patiently for someone to go out and bite a rat. <laughs> <laughs> but without success. In fact, when Typhus finally revealed his plans for a new plague to his colleagues at the St. Clough's Hospital for Frostbite and other rare tropical diseases, <laughs> everyone in the audience laughed at him. And as a result, he toured with the speech around the clubs and was eventually signed up for Celebrity Squares, <laughs> following, his, following his death in 1687. <laughs> And while we're on the subject of impersonation... The golden rays of golden sun fall on your golden hair And I brush aside the golden sheet And see you golden there And I wonder what you and I are going to do all day Cos I can't think of anything I want to do or say 
So I'll have to do what I did yesterday While we're still on the subject of impersonation... One of the funniest men I ever had the pleasure of knowing, Albert Modley. How do you know? (laughs) (laughs) By gum, it's hot. um, A fellow were walking along the road. He saw a notice on the factory. It said, wanted caretaker. Must be large, aggressive, strong and fearless. And I thought, by gum, that'd just suit the wife. Going along a bit further, a woman come up to him with the collecting tin. She said, can you spare ten pence to help the old ladies home? He said, are they out again? (laughs) 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 Eat it grand when you're daft. (laughs) (laughs) They were a plate layer on railway. (laughs) (laughs) He was going along one day, tapping lines, and all of a sudden, a big express train come up behind him. He started to run up the track, but it caught him. <laughs> and the hospital farmer went to see him. He said, you daft thing, why didn't you run up the embankment? He said, nay, if it can catch me on the flat, it's sure to catch me going up the <laughs> That was Peter Goodright, and before him, from aspects of the Edinburgh Fringe, were the Oxford Review, taking the mick something rotten out of the Bee Gees. I always thought the Bee Gees were taking the mickey something rotten out of somebody else. Some years ago, a book on music was published full of quotations about new musicians and their latest works, written by the critics at the time. It said things like, tuneless rubbish, cacophonous nonsense, no talent whatsoever. The musicians were, in fact, Beethoven, Wagner, Rossini and so on. Mark my words, the Oxford Review will be laughing on the other side of their faces when the Bee Gees bring out their choral symphony with a mass in B minor on the flip side. Here is Victor Borger taking the art out of Mozart. I'm going to play a composition by a Danish composer, Mozart. (laughs) Hans Christian Mozart. (laughs) Mozart, as some of you know, 
Unfortunately, he had no arms, no legs. He was only from about here up. Yeah. You have, of course, seen replicas of Mozart. <laughs> Mozart was what we call a bust. <laughs> yeah. In spite of that, the scholars say that he was happily married. But that Mrs. Mozart wasn't. <laughs> she, of course, went all the way to the floor. He only went to about table height. From above. I'm going to play one of his compositions. It's a short piece which he called Bagatelle because it is just a short piece. And Mozart himself wrote it for four hands. Yeah. But who has four hands? So <laughs> I made a special arrangement of it for two hands, which of course makes it twice as long. <laughs> but I play it twice as fast. <laughs> That's the end of that one. <laughs> President Carter has recently asked us to conserve energy, so I only play endings now. <laughs> I'm going to play two more endings. That's the last chord of the national anthem. That saves us from standing up. <laughs> That's the end of the opera Aida. That saves us a whole evening. <laughs> Victor Borger. Incidentally, there's one fact about Mozart which never ceases to amaze me. He wrote his first symphony at the age of seven because he was in bed with flu and bored. Amazing, isn't it? It's like Shakespeare writing King Lear while waiting for the tavern to open. And while we're on the subject of Shakespeare, let's go over to our best-selling poet of all time. Pam. Look, may I ask you a rather personal question? Yes, you say yes. you are a poet, a poet, and also a woman. Now, that's rather rare, isn't it? No, I've always been a woman. Have you? <laughs> oh! Well, moving on, tell me, what sort of poetry do you compose? Well, it is highly significant and meaningful, meaningful work for the thinking man, Frank. I see. <laughs> Does it rhyme as well? Never. No, I see. Um, mm. Aren't you familiar with my work then, Frank? F familiar with your work, Pamela? Of me? Familiar? What work do you do, actually, then? What's your work? <laughs> All right, highly significant. I'm yeah, I know <laughs> that. I've heard that monologue. I know. But, I mean, what do you do for a living? I take in a bit of washing. I oh! <laughs> That's your line. Aha! <laughs> no, no. No, I kept that one in. Listen, uh, Pamela, getting back to your poetry, I'm interested, you see, because being a, a, a fellow poet, and... <laughs> didn't you know that? Didn't you know that? No. Oh, you didn't? No. Ah, well, you see, a lot of... Oh, I'm sorry, but a lot of people make that mistake. See, some, no, they do. They think of me of just being a comedian. Well, Frank, oh. Frank, I can honestly say I never thought of you as being a comedian. <laughs> What I mean to say is, Frank, I think of you as an all-round entertainer. Well, I have put on a little weight, I know. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm sorry, yes, I understand what you mean. Well, isn't it funny, by sheer coincidence, I happen to have on my person a little snippet. A ditty. <laughs> listen, listen, a ditty. Now, I was, it's a ditty, you know. Now, I was wondering if you could give me your expert opinion. All right? Yes. OK, you don't mind? Right. No, no, I don't mind. Now, look, no. Pam, if you think it's no good, don't be afraid, just lie. Now, here goes. <laughs> Must have shush now, please. I will have shush. Blush, shush, blush, 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 blush. Now. Oh, little thrush that flies on high. How sweet you sing up in the sky. But now so swift away you fly. And I know the reason why. For you cannot in truth deny what you have done in my right eye. <laughs> in my life, I'm lost for words. Frank. Oh. oh, thank you. You're so sweet. Now, I'll do another one, then. This one's about a skylark. 
Oh, little skylark that flies on high, how sweet you sing up in the sky, and how so swift away you fly, and I know... Oh, now, hold on a minute, Frank. What? I don't like to mention this, but isn't it rather similar to the one that oh. went before? <laughs> well, it has similarities, I suppose. You see, I'm developing a style, you understand? Yes, but don't you write about anything but birds, Frank? Of course, yes. This is one of my recent pennings. Ode to an oil refinery. <laughs> Why, well, oh, yes. An oil refinery. Well, they're everywhere, Pam, let's be honest. An oil refinery to an oil right, refinery. Right. Oh, little oil refinery that flies on high. <laughs> and now, a poet's revenge. Hello, long distance, is that you? <laughs> Hello? 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 Oh, hello, Mum, it's me. Hello? <laughs> How are you keeping? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? How is everybody? All right? Yes, and we are too. 25 past seven here. <laughs> what time is it with you? <laughs> hey? Dad would like a word. Oh, he's just coming on, I see. Hello? How are you, Dad? Oh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? <laughs> How is everybody? All right? Yes, and we are too. 25 past seven here. <laughs> what time is it with you? <laughs> well, Dad, how's the weather? How's the weather? Nice, I suppose. I said, How is the weather? How's the weather, Stone the Crows? Dad! <laughs> just shout to Mum, I think she's on the bedroom phone. Tell her I can hear you both. Leave that one alone. Eh? Who asked me that? <laughs> was that you, Dad? No, it was Mum. 25 past seven here. <laughs> Rain? Yes, we have had some. Well, it rained up to the Thursday because I had the earache. <laughs> and then it brightened up. No, it was Friday, my mistake, because we had this thunderstorm. It scared us all out of our wits. Oh, it upset Mrs. Venn. Mrs. Venn, who has the fits. <laughs> fits. <laughs> Hello. I thought I'd lost you. <laughs> no, I got the dial in tone. Try not to shout so loud, Dad. Dad, why don't you use the phone? <laughs> All right, then. Better go, then, or we shan't afford the bill. <laughs> Just gone half past seven, Dad. <laughs> All right, then. Yes, we will. All the best. Mind there you go. And, Dad, stay off the booze. <laughs> Enjoy the rain. I'll ring again next time I've got some news. <laughs> Pam Ayres and Frankie Howard do have one thing in common. Like our next group, the Spinners, they've been to Australia in the past year or so. It's surprising just how many actors and entertainers go down under. Of course, there are better career prospects in Australia. I mean, being out of work near Bondi Beach beats being out of work in Barnsley any day. Sorry, Barnsley. Not that the spinners are out of work much. They've outlasted almost all their rival folk groups and have just celebrated 21 years together. And they're about to sing a song about a tup, which, for those of you who aren't farmers or Scrabble players, is a ram. As I was going to Derby all on a market day, I spied the biggest tup, sir, that ever was fed upon hay singing. Hey, dingle, Derby, dingle, dingle day. Hey, dingle, Derby, a dingle, dingle day. Now this tup was fat behind, sir, this tup was fat before. This tup was nine feet high, sir, if not a trifle more. Singing, hey, dingle, derby, dingle, dingle, day. Hey, dingle, derby, a dingle, dingle, day. And the horns upon this tup, sir, they grew up to the moon. A lad climbed up in January and didn't get back till June. Singing, hey, dingle, derby, dingle, dingle, day. Hey, dingle, derby, a dingle, dingle, day. And the wool upon his back, sir, it grew up in the sky. The eagles built their nests in it, I heard the young'uns cry, singing. Hey, dingle, derby, dingle, dingle, day. Hey, dingle, derby, a dingle, dingle, day. And the tail upon this tup, 
Sir, it reached way down to hell. And every time he waggled it, he rang the fireman's bell, singing, Hey, Dingle Darby, Dingle Dingle Day. Hey, Dingle Darby, a Dingle Dingle Day. Now the butcher that killed this tup, sir, he was up to his neck in blood. And the lad that was holding the basin, he got washed away in the flood, singing, Hey, Dingle Darby, Dingle Dingle Day. Hey, Dingle Darby, a Dingle Dingle Day. Well, then all the men of Darby come begging for his eyes. To make themselves some footballs off, for they was football size singing. Hey, Dingle Darby, Dingle Dingle Day. Hey, Dingle Darby, a Dingle Dingle Day. Yes, and all the women of Darby come begging for his ears to make them leather aprons off to last them 40 years singing. Hey, Dingle Darby, Dingle Dingle Day. Hey, Dingle Darby, a Dingle Dingle Day. Hey, yes, and all the ringers of Darby come begging for his tail. To toll St George's passing bell from the top of Derby Jail singing Hey Dingle Darby, Dingle Dingle Day Hey Dingle Darby, a Dingle Dingle Day Now the man that owned this top, sir, he was counted mighty rich But the fellow that sings this song said he's a lying son, son of a bitch singing Hey Dingle Darby, Dingle Dingle Day Hey Dingle Darby, a Dingle Dingle Day Well our song is nearly ended and we've little more to say so buy us all a jug of ale and we'll be on our way singing Hey, Dingle Darby, Dingle Dingle Day Hey, Dingle Darby, a Dingle Dingle Day Ah, the spinners. I hope it makes tough of the pups. <clears throat> but it won't if our next artists have anything to do with it, because now... It is time to meet an ordinary, everyday family that typifies all that is best in Britain, the Despons. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Despond. Mm. I understand, Mr. Despond, that you are now retired from work. Yes. And I miss it. Oh, he does. He does miss it. I do, it. I do miss it. He misses the companionship. The fun. Fun. And the jollity. Did you uh, work in a factory? No, slaughterhouse. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, uh, I wouldn't have thought a slaughterhouse was a, a jolly place. Oh, it was. <laughs> Man, it wasn't much fun on Saturdays. No. Well, that, that was your worst day, was it? Yes. Oh. We were closed. <laughs> We never killed anything. <laughs> oh, I used to like it when he came home and came told home. me all the funny things that had happened. Happened. Oh, he used to have me in fits. <laughs> With humorous anecdotes about felling a bullock. <laughs> or the day I missed a cow with the humane killer and shot Harry Clegg in the abbot's <laughs> After that, I called him Lefty. Lefty. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I want to know is, don't you have any hobbies, Mr Despot? Mm, yeah. Oh. <laughs> of course I do. Oh, of course he has hobbies. <laughs> I follow funerals. <laughs> Having listened to Les, and as the BBC insist on balance in all their programmes, here is the other point of view. It's uh, good of you to invite us out tonight, Charles. It uh, seems a nice restaurant. Uh, you know, Blanche and I really appreciate it. Not at all, sir. At least I could do. Monsieur, your mackerel. Oh, thanks. I trust you will find it to your satisfaction, monsieur. Oh, I'm sure I will. Uh, uh, hey, uh, just a minute, you. Monsieur? This, this mackerel, it's, it's winking at me. A very sociable fish is the mackerel, monsieur. <laughs> sociable or not, I'm here to eat the damn thing, not have an affair with it. Are you sure you've cooked it long enough? Cooked? Forgive me, monsieur. I do not understand. Well, you'd better understand, Sonny. I like my fish cooked. This isn't even dead. Dead? Dead? You expect... 
expect me to kill the fish? That's right. Yeah, kill the thing. Look, look, it's just jumping off my plate. Harry! It's on my skirt! Get it off, Harry! Oh, kill it, man. For heaven's sake, that's my wife it's attacking. You want me to kill you, million swine? Hit it! You use your boot, man. I see you end for this murderer. Harry! It's crawling up my tights! Stop it, Harry! Oh, for heaven's sake, poleaxe it! It's nibbling my knees, Harry! Get it off! Get the police, quick murder! Harder, man! Hit it harder! I've done it, sir! I bludgeoned it! Oh, Harry, that was awful! It was kissing my kneecap. Yeah, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> hey, you! You homicidal swine! <laughs> Have you no regard? No respect for life? Life is cheap to you Americans. You make me ill, the three of you. I say, steady on, I'm from Maidenhead. Then, for you, monsieur, the Cocovin. Blanch your handbag, punch it with your handbag. I can't, it keeps flapping about. Then wring its neck. My nose, it bit my <laughs> Give your bag to me, Blanche. You give it to me. Yes, yes, sir. You murdering American swine. Police, what do you say? Come here, let me kill the damn thing. It's walking in my ear, sir. Well, don't believe what it's saying. Hold it there. No, hurry, no. Take that. Shot. Blanche, wipe the blood and feathers off of your bag. Murderer, you murdered my cook of him. <laughs> and I'll murder you, you sniveling fat faced frog, if we have any more of this pathetic nonsense. You understand? I'll kill you. Kaput. Finny. Finito. Now, can we please get on with the meal? Very well. Madame, your mixed grill. Open the doors! <laughs> That was from Comedy First, a program for new scriptwriters and animal action groups. Who knows, though, perhaps those poor animals in broiler houses say to each other, look at those wicked farmers keeping all those wretched people cooped up in tower blocks to improve their breeding. Mind you, the 1980s should be a good time for farm animals. The way wildlife is disappearing, we'll soon be keeping cows in zoos. That's not as silly as it sounds, you know. We keep lions and tigers in our zoos because they're foreign. But in foreign zoos, I've actually come across some rare exotic creatures like swans and even pigeons. Here's what's described as a nature programme set entirely to music. Instant sunshine with the sounds of summer. The summer sun is streaming through my window. Summer sounds are rustling through the trees. Thunder clouds have vanished with the rainbow And skylarks are skylarking on the breeze I leave my desk and lock my door behind me Jumping on my bike I ride away To scented meadows where the phone won't find me And listen to the summer all the day In the meadow cows are mooing And the turtle doves are cooing and there's cock-a-doodle doing in the hay The honeybees are humming And the woodpeckers are drumming And the crickets are all coming out to play Oh, it? Lying in the sunshine Listening to the summer Summer has begun Bursting into song Listen to the summer all day All day On the heath, the willow grouse are grousing. Oh, go. And on the river, forehead pipe their note. In, In the, the barley, barley harvest, mice are mousing. <laughs> and from the barn, the bleating of, of a goat. goat. In the meadow, there's a cowbell ringing. <laughs> it is strewn above the chestnut tree. In the orchard, busy wasps are winging. And from the church the steeple clock strikes three In the stream the salmon's leaping And the meadow pipit's peeping While the screech owl's busy sleeping through till ten The crested newts are newting And the common coot is cooting And every pig is rooting in his pen Lying in the sunshine Listening to the summer Summer has begun 
bursting into song. Listen to the summer all day, all day long. Young lovers make a mossy bank their pillow. Escape the madding crowd And as they kiss beneath the weeping willow <laughs> Our love and sister on to love Hey there, Pop Pickles, welcome to another trip Damaging the ears of all who are near it There's no living creature dares to stay I listen to the summer <laughs> But can't hear it Rock and roll has frightened it away In the drums and cymbals banging And the lead guitar is twanging And the whole band clang-a-langing out the tune With the pop stars busy popping And the teeny boppers bopping Let's pray they'll all be stopping very soon Lying in the sunshine Listening to the summer Summer has begun Bursting into song Listen to the summer All day All day Instant sunshine And if you thought those were strange noises Spike Milligan has a story about an even stranger noise It's read by Roy Hudd And it comes from his programme I Like Spike and I like Spike as well. I have an uncle. His name is Herbert Jam. He was 52. He worked in a laundry. One Christmas Eve, he was homeward bound on a crowded bus when he heard what he thought was the sound of music coming from inside his boot. <laughs> Indeed, what was to make him famous had happened. His right foot had commenced to sing. Poor Mr. Jam tried to control the volume of sound by tightening his bootlace. It only succeeded in making the voice go from a deep baritone to a strangled tenor. <laughs> At the next stop, Mr. Jam had to get off. He walked home to the sound of his right foot singing, God rest you merry gentlemen. <laughs> Fortunately, Mr. Jam knew the words and mimed them whenever people passed by. <laughs> it was all very, very embarrassing. For three days, he stayed off work. His favourite TV programmes were ruined by unexpected bursts of song from the foot. He did manage to deaden it by watching with his foot in a bucket of sand. <laughs> but alas, from this practice, he contracted a rare foot rot, normally only caught by Arabs and camels. <laughs> Worse was to come. The foot started singing at night. At three in the morning, he was awakened with selections from the gondoliers, Drake is going west and a whiter shade of pale. <laughs> On the recommendation of his doctor, he visited the great Harley Street right foot specialist, Sir Ralph Fees. Come in. Uh, sit down. Now, oh, what appears to be our trouble? It's my right foot. Of course it is. What appears to be the trouble with our right foot? It sings. Sir Ralph paused, but still went on charging. <laughs> You say your foot sings? Yes, it's a light baritone. Sir Ralph started to write. I want you to go and see this psychiatrist. At which very moment, Uncle Herbert's foot burst into song. Uh, just a minute, I'll get my hat and come with you. <laughs> the medical world and Harley Street were baffled. For the time being, he had to make do with a surgical soundproof boot and a pair of wax earplugs. Occasionally, he would take off his boot to give the lads at the pub a song. But Mr. Jam was far from happy. Then came the beginning of the end. EMI gave him a 500 million pound contract for his foot to make records. <laughs> a special group was formed called The Grave. The billing was, wait for it, <laughs> Mr. Jam with one foot in the grave. <laughs> he was the new sensation of the year, but it became clear that it was the right foot that got the fame, not Mr. Jam. One night in a fit of jealousy, Mr. Jam shot his foot through the instep. It never sang again. <laughs> he was 52, happy. Only now he walked with a pronounced limp. L-I-M-P, pronounced limp. <laughs> <laughs> 
And from the story of someone who had his mouth on his foot, we go to the stories of people who put their feet in their mouths. Over to quote, unquote. Oh, and see if you can tell where you heard the chairman's voice before in this programme. Well, now it's time once more for me to invite the panel to recount any foot-in-mouth experiences that they may have had, or taken part in themselves, or observed in others, clangers, bricks, whenever words came out the wrong way. Uh, Denise Coffey, do you have one of these? Uh... Well, I believe that this is, this is a brick I did actually drop when I was a little baby journalist in Edinburgh doing interviews in the street. Um, and I believe it's actually uh, not that kind of interview in the street. Not, hello, dear, what are you doing? Um... <laughs> And uh, I believe it's actually kept in the BBC archives as an example of what not to do as an interviewer. Uh, I was asking people in the street um, how they manage their family finances, and I met this lady who said, um, Well, dear, I, I brought up my family on 25 shillings a week, and I had 17 children. And I said, My goodness, how did you manage that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard that uh, somebody arrived for a party at 8 o'clock on a Thursday and uh, discovered there was nobody there, and the, the hostess kindly said, would you like a drink, thank you, and was sitting about and said, um, there doesn't seem to be anybody else here. I, have I come on the right night? No, said the hostess. The party was last Thursday and you were at it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Derek Parker. Well, this is a story told to me by Felix Abrahamian, the music critic, about Sir Malcolm Sargent, the conductor, who was by way of being a snob. And one evening he was conducting way at the Albert Hall, and in a pause he leant over to his oboist, Leon Goosens, and he said, uh, Goosens, I want you to come round afterwards to the dressing room because I have a, a very dear friend I'd like you to meet. So after the performance, Goosens went around and the dressing room was thronged as usual. And eventually everybody left, except for Sargent and Goosens, and a tall, rather cadaverous man standing in the corner in a black frock coat and holding a bowler hat. And Sir Malcolm said, uh, Your Majesty, I would like to present to one of England's, perhaps Europe's, finest oboists, Mr Leon Goosens. Uh, Leon, this is my very dear good friend, the King of Sweden. And the gentleman in the black coat drew himself up, bowed slightly and said, Norway. <laughs> Kenneth. Well, actually, it's true, because I read this in the Sunday Times. <laughs> oh, it and, must uh, be true. So it's absolutely <laughs> true. I, I checked with it on with Adam Bryan about it. And it was at a foreign office reception when a minister rather bibulously teetered across the room to one of the guests and sunk upon his knees and cried out, Lovely creature in scarlet, dance with me. You lovely creature in scarlet. And this guest turned and said, I am the apostolic delegate and I don't think you're in any condition to dance. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, unquote, with Nigel Rees in the chair, the only man who goes into public toilets and copies the graffiti, and is paid by the BBC for it. In his spare time, when not being arrested, he practices his impersonations of Jonathan Miller, which you heard in a Burkis way. A quote, unquote, also has a round of eavesdroppings. You know, those snatches of conversation you suddenly overhear. I always remember overhearing a man on a bus talking about the weather after that extraordinarily hot summer of 76. He said, what a year. We have the driest summer in living memory, and now we have the wettest autumn on record. Typical, isn't it? It seems an appropriate moment to have a piece of music about the winter now. And you join us back here at the Formation Dance Team Championships. The next finalists are about to begin their display. The South East Midlands Massage Parlours Formation Dancers. <laughs> As I was about to say, here is the Philip Jones Brass Ensemble with a Swiss march. It comes from Zurich and it represents the end of winter when the townspeople march around the town and melt a snowman. Listen out for the sleigh bells. <laughs> journalists look back over the past year or past decade, they usually pick out events which are in some way significant or typical of the period. 
Here are some items picked out by the panellists on News Quiz, which are significant of absolutely nothing. This is from the Clare News in Ireland, uh, ERA. Uh, it was sent to New Statesman, actually, by the air traffic control staff at Shannon Airport, so God help us all. It goes, A Kilkishan man who, with nothing on from the way stop, was chasing his wife up the street, was given the probation act by Justice Hurley. Anthony McInerney had been charged with being drunk and disorderly. Garda John Reardon said McInerney apologised the following day and said he had been at a wedding. The justice said, he is suitably attired now. We will ban him from all weddings for a fortnight. <laughs> Clement Freud, what have you for us? Well, mine came very simply from the television column of the Daily Express on the day when ITV were on strike on one of those days, and one looked with some care at the evening entertainment. And it simply said, Gina Lollabrigida in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. (laughs) (laughs) And it occurred to me they must have shot it backwards. (laughs) And Leslie... Well, I range far and wide in my reading, and I found this in the Australasian Express. It's a little report which goes, A partially blind man who was fined for drinking and driving swore this week he would never drive again. I can drive all right, Mr Diggleman said. I just can't see. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Finally, Alan, what have you got for us? Cambridge Evening News, another another heartstring pull here, Barry. <clears throat> the man seemed normal enough when he came into the hospital, said Dr Stevenson, who was the duty casualty officer. But he grew gradually more agitated in the waiting area and finally jumped up, ran over to the admissions desk and offered to sell his body to the hospital. <laughs> the sister explained to him that he could will his body to the hospital but could not have the cash in advance. <laughs> the man became very belligerent and had to be restrained by two porters. When police arrived, he told them, It's diabolical. I only asked a lousy tenor, and there's not a mark on me. (laughs) You could get a thousand quid for me in America. (laughs) Rowan Atkinson is a young man you may not have heard of, destined for a great career. Actor, writer, comedian, mime artist, impressionist, he recently did a programme called Atkinson People on Radio 3, in which he cast a somewhat jaundiced eye over the acting profession. But as a blind man is little without his dog, so an actor is nothing without his director, and I should pay tribute to all those directors who have squeezed every last dropper out of the lemon of my talent. Men like Spigot, Rambrinsky, Bartok and Monk. A young director that I always particularly admire and enjoy working with is David Feet. David is a young man with enormous promise. He's just begun rehearsals on a new play at the Royal Court, The Death Beetle. I'm, I'm told it's a powerful drama about a gay locksmith. I understand that rehearsals are going very well. Darling, I've got something very important to say to you. What's that, my dear? I'm afraid we're out of coffee. That's all right. I didn't want any. Well, I'd better come out with it, then. I've just murdered your lover. No, now, uh, Steve, your first line. Sorry, darling, I've got something very important to say to you. Right, it's followed by your second line. Uh, no, no, no. I'm sorry, it's followed by Joan's first mm. line, which is followed then by your second line. Yes. What is it? Sorry, I, I'm afraid we're out of coffee. Sorry, I'm afraid we're out of coffee. Sorry, no, I'm afraid we're out of coffee. Sorry, no, I'm afraid we're out of coffee. No, all I said, David, was, I'm afraid we're out of coffee. I'm afraid we're out of coffee. I've got something important to say. I'm afraid we're out of coffee. It's important, you see. It's crucial to the entire play. Do you see that? Yeah. OK, from the top. Darling, I've got something very important to say to you. Good. What's that, darling? I'm afraid we're out of coffee. Bigger, Stephen, please. Surely, David, the passionate line comes later. I've just murdered your lover. Peter, we're dealing in this play with a highly intelligent man. Of course. So why should he lie at this time? Mm. I have something important to say... I'm afraid we're out of coffee. It really is that simple. Again, please. Darling, I've got something important to say to you. Good, good, good. What's that, my dear? Knockout. I'm afraid we're out of coffee. No, Peter, passion. passion. I'm afraid we're out of coffee. More! I can't do it anymore! Good, good, better. From the top. Darling, I've got something to say to you. What's that? I'm afraid we're out of coffee! Don't worry, I didn't want any. Well, I'd better come out with it, then. I've just murdered your lover. OK, good. Marvellous. Yes, it's a, it's a start. David, look, surely, don't you think the focus could shift slightly? Well, of course it the... could. 
We could make cars without wheels, but they wouldn't be a lot of use. Well, that's true. All right, come on, let's get it right. Can I say something? One. I'm afraid we're out of coming! It's coming, it's coming. For those of you who've just switched on, I'd like to say... Welcome back to the Formation Dance Finals, as onto the floor come the East-West Midlands Nervous Milkman Formation Dancers. <laughs> Oh, those interfering grumbleweeds again. And back here at the Formation Dance Finals, you join us just in time to see the South Midlands Northeast Eddie Waring Impressionists Formation Dancers. <laughs> I do wish they'd shut up. You're getting right up my nose, pal. <laughs> oh. Oh, sorry. Anyway, for those of you who've just tuned in to the BBC, you're in good company because we've just got a load of late arrivals. Let me remind you, teams, that these are late arrivals for the broadcasting ball. Oh, what a lovely young lady over there. Thea Chers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, an elderly lady over there from the Your Way family. Dawn Your Way. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh you remember her. Oh, from the dear old days of 2LO. Hello, hello. Here comes Alexandra Paris, who's just laid Lord Wreath. <laughs> oh, we're in gossipy mood, are we? <laughs> yes. Yeah, Alistair Cook and letters from America. <laughs> <laughs> Mr and Mrs to quite a lot of radio and their daughter, Alison to a quite a lot of radio. <laughs> She's the cat's whisker. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> All the way from the States, will you welcome Buck at bedtime? <laughs> he knows his own business best. And sharing the same flight from the States, Mr and Mrs Street from America, the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> All right, then, Mr and Mrs Pie and their daughter Meg Pie. <laughs> With her fiancé, Henny, questions. <laughs> oh, here's a drunken Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Lars of the summer wine. <laughs> oh. oh dear, oh, the lisping sun, Nathan Wide. <laughs> and all the way down from Bonnie, Scotland, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Dwarled and their little son, We Ken Dwarled. <laughs> <laughs> and you remember With his her chum. sister, <laughs> Tamara Smurf. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look, there's an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and that splendid fellow, Freddie Knight, his music night. Oh, yes. And Mandy, night at eight. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Jack and Ori. Not to mention Michael Fish and his place, cool. <laughs> Another late comer from Scotland, you and the night in the music. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is where we come to the end of Sorry, I'm Having a Clue and their son from Israel, Haim, Sorry, I Haven't a Clue. <laughs> uh, I've been asked to say that if you would like to groan at a BBC programme, please write to the ticket unit. And to close the programme, we'll do a bit of crystal gazing. Mind you, there's lots of people we could ask about what's going to happen in the future. The Buddhists are up to the year 2,507. In northern India, they're up to 2037, and the Chinese and the Jews are thousands of years ahead of us. I wonder if they've got any old calendars they don't want. It's the Copts that are struggling a bit. They're only up to 1696, poor things. Anyway, crystal gazing. One programme last year looked ahead at the arts in 1980 and found that apart from half the theatres in the West End being turned into parking lots and there being umpteen revivals of old musicals, there were plans for a remarkable blockbusting new musical. Here is the hit song from the rhyme of the ancient mariner called, of course, Seaweed. It's always been my deepest wish to fall in love one day But you're half human, half a fish it's much more fun that way I'd like to take you in my arms But I'm afraid I'd fail You would be my bag of charms I'd be your piece of tail I'd like to run my fingertips 
up and down your scales. I'm a mermaid. You're a man. I'll try to do the best I can. We'll be happy evermore with seaweed, with seaweed, with seaweed round the door. Seaweed, 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 seaweed. That was something appealing, something appalling. And I imagine that was the something appalling part. Well, I think that's about it. Just remains for me to wish you a very happy new year, whatever century you're in, and thank you for having me. My thoughts were put into words by Barry Pilton, and the words put into the programme by producer Jonathan James Moore, who tells me we've still got a minute left. Right, over to you, Kenneth Williams. Your subject is the Omar Khayyam, and you have just a minute. Most of what England knows of Omar Khayyam is, of course, the Rubaiyat, which comes by courtesy to us through the good work of Fitzgerald. How often these words have reverberated through my mind. Myself, when young, did eagerly frequent and with fast footsteps car scattered on the grass in my joyous errand reached the spot where I made one turn down an empty glass. Ah, moon, not my delight that knows no way. <laughs> oh, even to hear those again sends me into an ecstatic realm and I think Omar Khayyam. Ah, you old Persian nit. You were no fool when it came to writing the verse because in life he was completely misguided and laid up for himself the most dreadful debts and was continually being asked... <laughs> Bye from me. Have a smashing 1980.